First, the emergency services come to the rescue again as Michael Burke presents 999. All of tonight's rescues are true stories. We've sometimes used actors or stuntmen, but everything you see and hear is based on the accounts of the people involved. They've helped us to reconstruct events as they happen. Tonight on 999, a terrifying fall in the snowfields of the Lake District. The rescue helicopters flying blind. Safety advice on the vital role you can play in a helicopter rescue. And lost at sea, two surfers struggle to survive as rescuers race to find them. Negotiating a horizontal sheet of ice is tricky enough, but climbers and adventurous hill walkers faced with a sloping wall of ice would need one of these to stop themselves slipping. It's an ice axe, and this particular one belongs to Gary Hogan from Merseyside, who had to use it when things started to go wrong during a Christmas break with friends in the Lake District. The Patterdale Mountain Rescue Team took part in our reconstruction of what happened, and many of them were involved in the original rescue. They had to use their own ice axes as essential tools in the fight to save Gary, who's played here by an actor. We're going to come up to Thornthwaite Crag. Now, there's quite a steep climb there. It had become a tradition. For the fifth year running, the group of friends, all experienced walkers, were planning their route. So if we get to Mar de la Belle here, yeah, yeah. Gary Hogan and Bernard Gorman had grown up on the same street. Together with their close friend, Len Andrews, they started fell walking as venture scouts. And back for the pint. Back for the pint, ball too. There's just no way that anybody could survive that fall. He must have slipped down into one of the most remotest valleys in the lakes. Probably some of the worst conditions that we've had the helicopter come in. I don't think any of us on that crew ever sort of pushed the boat out quite as far as that and probably don't want to again, really. Good timing, really. Yeah. And then back to the hostel and then uh, back to the pub. Have our tea and... Gary's uh, a, uh, you know, happy-go-lucky chap. He's, he's a very gutsy person. I, I think he's probably one of the most bravest persons I've ever met. So it's not a particularly long day. It's like being back at the scouts, eh? Eight mile like. <laughs> he always likes to be the centre of attention. And, uh, you know, he's a bit of a performer. Uh, but he's, he, and he's, he's a very good friend. Up to the cairn and then north. And if it's covered in snow up there, it would be really nice. OK, lads, let's go. Come on, Bernie. Hi ho. Hi -ho. He's oh, on, Bernie. Hey, he's on. Hey, work we go. Len and Gary sort of played off each other, almost like a comedy team, really. I was the sort of a straight man. And these two would play off each other. And if you were with them, there was always a kind of a banter going on between the two of them. Come on. OK. Go on, Bernie, off you go, mate. They were well equipped for their walk There's along the ridge here, known like. as High Street. I'm going to stop and take a photograph. Hey, look at them, what, okay. Lenny? Let's have a go at that. Gary spotted other walkers sliding down a snowfield with their ice axes. Come on, let's have a go, come on. Yes, come on! Yeah. One or two of them started to slide in the snow and using their axes to, to break, practicing ice axe breaking. <laughs> Instinctively, I felt from the vantage position I had above them that it wasn't a safe place to choose because. The snowfield ended and we couldn't see what was beyond the line of snow. And without knowing what was there, I felt uneasy about them doing what they were doing. When you're walking in, in deep snow, if you do slip and slide, the ice axe can be used as, as an anchor, almost as a brake. Some of the others also made the most of the opportunity to practice with their ice axes, including Dave Rickwood. I think everybody was quite keen because I think everybody had new ice axes and I think it was a bit like a new toy and everybody wanted to have a go. It's really just a question of taking a lot of caution as you go down and staying in control. Yeah! Gary was travelling faster than everybody else, so he was sliding. He was almost like a slippery seal sliding down the hill and he was really enjoying it. Yeah! He must have gone another 20 yards beyond everybody. Ah! I started to get worried. Things got out of control. Gary! We realised he was going over the lip 
of the ridge. We were just horrified actually seeing Gary just topple over the edge and tumble down the rocks. He was free falling and then he bounced off a few rocks. Eventually he hit some snow which seemed to break his fall and he just went into a roll all the way down. He just flipped over the edge and um, I just, I just stood there stunned. I just couldn't believe what I'd seen. Where Gary had departed the edge, his ice axe was sticking in the snow. And uh, I thought at the time, thinking, my God, you know, it's rather like an epitaph to his uh, demise. I just thought at that point that he's dead and we're going to be going down to recover a, a dead body. So we were just, uh, you know, just overwhelmed with the horror of the whole incident. Where is it? Right on the Gary had way. fallen 700 the feet. Oh. Oh. I couldn't believe it. It was about 85 degrees. It was almost vertical. It was virtually a cliff face at my feet. We had to affect the rescue plan. Um, so emotions, in a sense, went, in, went into a cupboard somewhere. I can go down and put in a, a call for the mountain rescue. It, it was the, decided uh, that Steve Hankin and myself yeah, would go four, down four, and four, put in a call for the mountain four, rescue. Four, Dave Rickwood, four, because he had climbing experience, he was going to okay. actually climb down over the cliff face, down four, right. towards Gary. Two when we were looking at the map, we noticed about a quarter of a mile away there was a mountain rescue post. Okay. So I took a party and we trudged off through the snow, taking the group of four to the mountain rescue point. Uh, you had some got any cramp ones on. Uh, I don't think you'll make it down there, but we can get round uh, Rigandale Crag. The brothers Neil and Anthony Collier offered to try a quicker route to reach Gary using their crampons. Right, lads, we'll head off. Part of the problem was that not having crampons, it was rather difficult for us to descend uh, a very steep slope but the yeah, two yeah. Collier twins, yeah, time, um, they is. were able to walk down. Well, the other guys didn't try it. They had axes and crampons. Yeah, um, right. I think they'd actually been climbing that day. They went off on a slightly easier angle than we did. Yeah. Okay. We life, didn't right. really have any full climbing length ropes, but we did have some walking ropes. So we tied those ropes together and we set up an ice axe pilot. We placed the ice axe in a kind of cross formation. Yes. So right. uh, when we put weight on the rope, it braced itself against the horizontal one. As Dave and another climber, Kevin Way, prepared to abseil down, the other party were in for a disappointment. We eventually found a mountain rescue post, which was just barely visible sticking out of the snow. It's solid ice here. As the light faded, Dave and Kevin made slow progress. One false move and they would fall too. One step at a time, the Collier brothers were going as fast as they dared. Bernard had taken 40 minutes to reach a phone. Yes, police, please. At the forefront of my mind was the knowledge that by the time we got in the call, I didn't know whether my mate was dead or alive. And it's somebody I've known for over 20 years. Can I call out Mountain Rescue, please? Because it was between Christmas and New Year, of course, everybody was on holiday, so having just come home and have a glass of whiskey and put our feet up and relax for the rest of the night was really quite a prospect. <laughs> An accident like this, where we know someone's injured, there's an immediate call for the team, and everyone makes their way to base. One of them's fallen down towards Rigandale, I think it's about 100 feet. Everyone crashes onto the fell with the vehicles as soon as there's enough men to man the first vehicle. The mountain rescue team could only drive so far. They'd end up carrying their kit. It's just solid. Meanwhile, Len and his team were having no luck digging out extra rescue equipment in the buried hut. It was very frustrating when we actually dug through the soft snow and met hard, compacted ice. And even our ice axes weren't getting through it. Here. I think we're going to have to head back to the ridge, join the rest of the party. It was now an hour after Gary's fall. Finally, the colliers reached him. Come on, Come on. Oh, William, mate. Right. Yeah. He was alive, but they'd no idea how serious his injuries were. Oh, hey, don't move, don't move. That's it. Moments That's it. later, Dave and Kevin also yeah, arrived. Okay right, mate? He looked quite a mess. Uh, his clothing was torn. Right, just going to have a look at your head, all right? He'd obviously damaged his head quite badly. 
he was in quite a bit of pain. Ah, so ah, we're going to stick a bandage ah, on it to try and stop the bleeding. Bernard's ah, gone for the, gone ah, for the mountain rescue. Bernie. We didn't want to move him very much. We wanted to make as comfortable as we could. Oh, God. I'm freezing now. Freezing. We had a stove with us, so we were able to knock up some brews, scooping up pans of snow and melting it to make yeah. drinks. It's difficult to know what more we could do Just moisten really, to your keep lips. him warm. Right, mate. Okay, that's enough for now. Okay. Okay? Yeah. You're gonna buy us one tomorrow? Drunk. Yeah, I'll buy you. We buy talked you. to Gary. Yeah. I think we were all very worried that he would sort of lapse off into unconsciousness. Certainly his eyes were beginning to go. He seemed to be going off in the distance somewhere. As dust fell, the weather was definitely getting worse. Bernard guided the mountain rescue team to the spot where Gary had fallen. They'd already had a tough walk up to High Street. I think you can see some markings in the snow here. Hello! Help had arrived, but their wait was far from over. Yeah. Go, lads! Take the torch off and flash it so they can see. Over here! There it is! We'd expected him to be about 100 feet down. He was about 700 feet down the dale. We had this interesting discussion, which um, probably isn't repeatable on television, when we realised how far down, down Riggendale it was. There's lights on the ridge that you can oh, down, Gary. Yeah, you're going to be all right. Yeah, should just be a few minutes now. They opted to go straight down to save time, but first they needed a solid anchor. So we decided to use a dead man, which is an aluminium plate, which we drive into the snow at an angle. When it's loaded, it digs deeper and more solidly into the snow. Four ropes to a considerable weight on the belay plate, and especially when wet. They had no way of testing whether it would hold their weight, but they had no choice. They had to get to Gary. It was a bit softer here, it's OK. Dr John Ellerton, a local GP, began to climb down the most direct route, which is also the steepest. How long have we been here, eh? A couple of hours. Feels like years, years mate. Now. It was tempting to rush, but the mountain rescue team knew that could lead to further accidents. High above, on the ridge, Ian put his own life on the line as he started to climb. I descended with half of the stretcher. And I thought it would be preferable, rather than freely outsail on the road, to actually climb down beside it, and that would put less strain on the belay, and therefore it would have less risk of the thing coming out on me. The Trusset Loop is a loop of climbing rope which is about five millimetres diameter. They actually slide down a rope, providing that they are held. As soon as they are let go, they seize upon the rope and stop. So I climbed down beside the rope, moving the knot down as I descended. In darkness, on that kind of a route, you're concentrating on a very small area of ground in front of you. All your attention is on the face that you're going down. Something missed, either a foot or my hand or the ice axe or whatever. My first instinct, of course, was to grab onto whatever I still had hold of, which happened to be the prussic knot. And of course, the more one grabs onto it, the more it slides down the rope. So with a conscious effort, I let go of that, and then bounced two or three times before the um, prussic knot finally seized and stopped me going any further down the rope. I'd cleared most of the most difficult part of the journey fairly quickly. Hey, we're from 1-5. I've just had a bit of slip on this. Anybody else coming down, if you could tell them to watch for ice over. Although Ian had fallen 30 feet, he was anxious not to delay the rescue anymore. Somebody here? Yeah. Somebody coming? Yeah. Yeah. It had already taken the doctor half an hour to climb down to Gary. How's the casualty? Somebody coming? He'd been lying in freezing temperatures for almost four hours. Yeah, yeah. So one bloke, head injuries. We think he might have lost consciousness. Dr. Ellerton immediately realised that Gary's injuries were too grave to risk carrying him down the slope. The situation that Gary was in was where he had very serious head injuries and he had other limbs broken. His condition was such that any lengthy or prolonged evacuation meant that it would have worsened and would have threatened the possibility of a successful evacuation at all.
We request a helicopter to the casualty site, over. The crew was scrambled from RAF Bulma, 100 miles away. Rescues in the mountains are uh, one of the most hazardous things that we do, particularly at night, uh, because of weather factors, which is always your, your prime enemy, really, uh, are exaggerated so much by the mountains. Uh, the weather's getting a bit worse now. It's starting to snow quite heavily. OK, I'll stop at the lecture on my side. Roger. 60. Height is good. It was a dark night. There were strong winds. There was a lot of snow around. I, I was using night vision goggles to confirm that, in fact, we were where we thought we were. Still a good visual down the back. Roger. At this stage, we were flying at about 40 feet. The snow shower increased in intensity to such an extent, in fact, that I lost visual references with the ground. OK, lost visual aborting on instruments. The crew were now flying blind, okay, and we're in real down. danger of crashing yeah, into the mountain. Down. 200 feet. It's a bit like driving a car into, uh, into a fog bank and then having to control it in three dimensions. There was probably silence between the four of us because we were all sitting, waiting and hoping that, that we weren't going to hit the side of a mountain. 600, still going up. It got very tense, obviously. What I had to do was to pull in maximum power and we then shot up like, a bit like the cork out of the bottle. We flew out climbing uh, to get clear of the mountain sides. I was very annoyed that we weren't going to get to the casualty and very tense that uh, we were in close proximity to, um, to granite in cloud. How long before I get out of here? Well, I we could hear the helicopter on a number of occasions, the sound getting louder, him getting closer, and then fading away again. Um, what's the UTA for the helicopter? Uh, we haven't had a message back on that. We're still waiting on that, John. There were times when I thought, well, maybe we're going to have to stretch him out. Maybe the helicopter won't get to him. Rescue 131, we've aborted uh, due to bad weather and uh, heading for Penrith, over. Rescue helicopter 131. Casualty is serious, we would appreciate you trying again, over. Gary's condition was very serious. To have a helicopter and to have almost immediate access to hospital treatment became absolutely critical. Considerable pressure and considerable pleading was placed upon the helicopter pilot to actually come back in and to make another try to see if we could get Gary out. They're above us here. They quite uh, succinctly let us know that the casualty was in a, a pretty bad way and it was basically life or death for him. I announced my intentions to go back and looked across at the co pilot who I, I don't think could believe it. We'll make one further attempt to uh, get into your situation. Fate stepped in and there was a, a large break in the cloud, so we spiralled down in descent. We then had to climb up through the cloud layer because the casualty must have been about a thousand feet above us at least. We could see the lights of the odd flare as well that they were letting off. I think I can hear them down below us in the cloud area. The weather had decidedly wasn't by then. The helicopter itself was got in a fairly strong flooding which just swept the whole valley that the snow flood came down. I don't know why, but, but um, climbers tend to fall on the downdrafting side of, of hills, which gives us a few problems in controlling the aircraft, and sometimes even having just enough power to be able to hover. The wind was actually tumbling down over the top and blowing straight down into the bowl. Quite remarkable, really. I think their conditions were... I wouldn't necessarily like to be out on the road on a push bike in some of them. It must be on the margins of what's possible. Gary had fractured his skull and injured his knee. He was back at work within a fortnight, but still needed months of physiotherapy. I thought it was just a bad tumble. I didn't even realise the seriousness of the fall itself. I didn't realise how, how far it'd fallen. I remember starting the descent with the, with the ice axe. And then I remember all of a sudden I, I was going really fast. And so I started to put the ice axe here. And things just seemed to get out of control. And the ice axe was just cutting through, like a knife through butter. It was only then I looked down and realized that the mountain had come to an end. It was similar to the cartoon situation where when you just keep travelling without any anything either above or below you. I remember vaguely reaching the bottom and then thinking to myself that obviously the boys up top, Len and Byrne in particular, 
would be really worried because it was, it was obviously a bad fall. While I was in hospital, one of the nurses had received a call from an old girlfriend of mine, Jill. When I got back from home, we met up again and we got married. And now we've got three young, healthy and active children. If I hadn't survived that, then there'd be a number of lives that wouldn't be here today. And that's not just mine, it's my children. Every day now, to me, is a bonus. And as a result of that fall, I've become, if anything, more positive about life. And I don't look back, I look ahead. And every day, to me, is just an extra day onto a life that I could have lost.